Welcome to Simpler Bible, a daily journey to biblical understanding. Episode 52. Today, we're going to cover four chapters, 22, 23, 24, and 25 of Numbers. It's a lot, but we kind of need to cover it all at once because it's one narrative story of this guy named Balaam, a king named Balak, and of course, the people of God wandering in the wilderness. Now, keep in mind that this is happening in the last six months before they go into the promised land. Everything that we're going to cover now from now on is happening in these last six months of the people's time in the wilderness. And so just we want to pay attention to that. We want to note that. All right. And I will I will read this to you as quickly as I can, but it might be a few minutes longer today. We'll see. So Numbers 22 verse 1 says this, Then the people of Israel set out, camped in the plains of Moab beyond the Jordan at Jericho. So this is, they're right now at the edge of Jericho, which is going to be the first city that they're going to attack when they go into the promised land. We'll see that in Judges 2 and Judges 6, but we're not there yet. Sorry, Joshua 2 and Joshua 6, not Judges. Balak, the son of Zippor, he's a king, Balak's a king, uh, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites, and Moab was in great dread of the people because they were very many. Moab was overcome with fear of the people of Israel. And Moab said to the elders of Midian, This horde will lick us up and all that surrounds us as an ox licks up the grass of the field. So Balak, the son of Zippor, who was the king of Moab at that time, sent messengers to Balaam, the son of Beor, at Pethor, which is near the river in the land of the people of Ammah, to call him, saying, Behold, a people has come out of Egypt. This is 38 or 39, sorry, 40 years later, right? 40 years later. And people has come out, out of Egypt. They cover the face of the earth and they are dwelling opposite me. Come now and curse the people for me since they are too mighty for me. Perhaps I will be able to defeat them and drive them out from the land. For I know that the one whom you bless is blessed and the one whom you curse is cursed. So that's the reputation that Balaam has. Whoever he blesses is blessed. Whoever he curses is cursed. So they go to Balaam and they they say, hey, look, we, we want you to come and curse these people. And Balaam's response seems very noble. And he says, Lodge here tonight, this is verse 8, Lodge here tonight, and I will bring back to you the word of the Lord, whatever he speaks to me. So God came to Balaam and said, Who are these men with you? And Balaam said to God, Balak, the son of Zippor, the king of Moab, has sent to me, saying, Behold, a people has come out of Egypt, Egypt covers the face of the earth. Now come and curse them for me. Perhaps I will be able to fight against them and drive them out. But God said to Balaam, You shall not go out with them. You shall not curse the people, for they are blessed. So God tells Balaam, You can't curse these people because I've blessed them. And so Balaam rises in the morning and he says, go back to your own land. Verse 13 goes back to your own land for the Lord has refused to let me go with you. So Balak does not like this answer that Balaam's not going to come. So he sends another group of messengers and says, look, I'll bless you. I will pay you handsomely. I'll give you a lot of money and, and I will bless you. He says this, uh, verse 17, I will do you great honor and whatever you say f- to me to do for you, I'll do it for you. Just come and curse these people. So Balaam says, look, you could give me your house full of gold and silver, and I could not go beyond the commandment of my Lord God to do less or more. Again, Balaam sounds really noble. It sounds like he's submitting himself to the Lord. So Balaam ends up going with these messengers. The Lord tells him he can go. There's some kind of interesting things here because God tells him he can go. And then the next day, the Lord tries to kill him. And it's interesting because you're like, wait, God just told him he could go. But again, the problems with Balaam's heart, as we'll see in a moment. So God, in verse 22, is ready to kill Balaam. It says God's anger was kindled against Balaam because he went. And the angel of the Lord, the angel of the Lord, keep that in mind, took his stand in his way as an adversary. And now he was riding his donkey and his two servants were along with him. And the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with a drawn sword in his hand. And the donkey turned aside out of the road and went into the field. So Balaam struck the donkey and turned her back into the road. Then the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path between the vineyard, uh, between the vineyards with a wall on either side. And the donkey saw the angel of the Lord and she pushed against the wall and pressed Balaam's foot against the wall. So he struck her again. Then the angel of the Lord went ahead and stood in a very narrow place where there was no way to turn left or right. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she lay down under Balaam and Balaam's anger was kindled and he struck the donkey with his staff. And the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey and she said to Balaam, what have I done to you that you've struck me these three times? Balaam said to the donkey, because you have made a fool of me, I wish I had a sword in my hand for I would kill you. And the donkey said to Balaam, am I not your donkey on which you've ridden all your life to this day? Is it my habit to treat you this way? And he said, no. I I just want to highlight this for a minute. Balaam is not freaked out by his donkey talking. That that is weird to me. That is a peculiar thing. I don't have a lot of time to go into it because we have a lot to cover in this episode today. But shouldn't that freak him out a little bit? 
Like his donkey sees an angel. Balaam doesn't see it. The donkey turns off the road. He beats the donkey. The donkey goes in between two walls because he sees the angel. He beats the donkey. The donkey lays down because he sees the angel. He beats the donkey. The donkey's like, why are you hitting me? And Balaam answers the donkey instead of going, wait, you can talk? Like he just answers him. And he's like, look, I've been your, she goes, I've been your donkey your whole life. Have I ever treated you this way? And he goes, no. And she goes, then why are you hitting me? And so then God opens the eyes of, of Balaam and he can now see the angel. And look at what it says in verse 31. He saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his sword drawn in his hand and he bowed down and he fell on his face. Balaam falls down before the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord said to him, why have you struck your donkey these three times? Behold, I have come to oppose you because your way is perverse before me. Hold that in your mind. That's really, really important because so far it doesn't seem like Balaam's doing anything wicked. Your way is perverse before me. So that's why God is going to oppose Balaam. The donkey saw me and turned aside before me these three times. If she had not turned aside from me, surely just now I would have killed you and let her live. Now, when Balaam is having the conversation with the donkey, what does he say? I wish I had a sword in my hand. I would have killed you. But check this out. If Balaam had had a sword in his hand and killed the donkey, then the sword in the angel's hand would have been against Balaam. The angel says, the only reason I didn't kill you is because your donkey kept turning away. Like I was about to kill you. But if Balaam had killed the donkey, then Balaam would have died that day. So it appears that Balaam's doing right. And he says, look, angel of the Lord tells him, only say what I, what I speak to you to say. And Balaam shows up to Balak and he says, I can only tell you what God tells me to say. And it seems like Balaam is noble. It seems like what he's doing honors the Lord, except for we already know that the angel of the Lord, probably a picture of Jesus Christ, because the angel of the Lord receives worship. The angel of the Lord declares things that only God can declare. So the angel of the Lord says, your heart is perverse. Or he doesn't say your heart is perverse. He says, your way is perverse before me. There's something in Balaam that is wicked and God sees it. And so he comes to King Balak, says, I'll, I can only say what God tells me to tell you. So let me, let me give you a quick summary. There are going to be four oracles of Balaam. The first three, he's going to do kind of to try to appease Balak. And so he's going to stand. Balak says, I want you to stand on this cliff that's overlooking these people, stand on this mountain overlooking these people and curse them. And Balaam tries to curse them but he blesses him instead is what the Bible will tell us later. So Balaam, the Bible says God turns his curse into a, a blessing. So Balaam speaks a blessing over the people. This ticks off Balak and he goes, no, 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 look, come over here. Maybe if you only see a part of them, you'll curse them. So Balaam blesses that little part. Balak is mad and he says, look, let me take you to a place where you can only see a small portion of them. Just curse the small portion and Balaam blesses them a third time. And then a fourth time moved by the spirit of God, he blesses the people. So let's Let's look here. Um, let's look here at what the blessings are or what the statements are. The first one is in chapter 23, verse 8. And here's what he says. How can I curse whom God has not cursed? How can I denounce whom the Lord has not denounced? For from the top of the crags I see him, from the hills I behold him. Behold a people dwelling alone, not counting itself among the nations. Who can count the dust of Jacob? Who can number even the fourth part of Israel? Let me die the death of the upright. Let my end be like his. That's the first blessing. Balak is frustrated. He goes, what did you do to me? I brought you here to curse my people and you're going to bless them? And he says, look, I can only do what God tells me to do. The second oracle comes in verse 18 and it says this, Balaam took up this discourse and said, rise Balak and give ear to me. Hear, O son of Zippor, Zippor, God is not a man that he should lie nor a son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said and will he not do it? Has he spoken and will he not fulfill it? So a couple of things, people use this verse all the time to talk about the character of God and it's a good thing to talk about. Uh, God is not a man that he should lie. He doesn't, he doesn't change his mind like man does. But what's in, what's in store here is a very specific situation. Balak says, curse these people. Balaam blesses the people. Balak says, come over here and curse them instead. And Balaam goes, you really think God's going to change his mind? Like five minutes ago, he blessed the people. You think he's going to curse them now? God's not a man that he's going to change his mind. So he goes on to say this. He says, behold, I have received a command to bless and God is blessed. I can't revoke it. He has not beheld misfortune in Jacob. He has not seen trouble in Israel. The Lord, their God is with them. The shout of a king is among them. God brings them out of Egypt and is for them like the horns of a wild ox. For there is no enchantment that can be taken against Jacob, no divination that can be taken against Israel. Now it will be said of Jacob and Israel, look what God has done. Look what God has wrought. Behold a people. 
as a lioness, it rises up. As a lion, it lifts itself. It does not lie down and until it has devoured the prey and drunk the blood of all of the slain enemies. So now not only is it a blessing to Israel, but it's forecasting what's going to happen to the Moabites. Balaam, of course, does not like, or sorry, Balak, of course, does not like this. He goes, all right, come and bless them. Come and curse them one more time, just a smaller portion. Chapter 24. Listen to this. This is key. Chapter 24, verse 1. When Balaam saw that it pleased the Lord to bless Israel, he didn't go as other times to look for omens, but set his face towards the wilderness. So let me explain something. The previous two times, he had made sacrifices to idols, trying to divine something, trying to get some sort of mystic uh, proclamation against the people of God. And when he sees, now remember, the Bible tells us in a later text, Balaam tried to curse the people, but God turned the curse into his blessing. So the first two times, Balaam's trying to curse them, but God turns it into a blessing. And now he sees that it pleases God to bless them. So he doesn't make the sacrifices to these idols on the third time, and he just blesses the people. And he says this, and this is really interesting. This is different now in verse 2, 24, 2, the spirit of God came on him. The first two times, uh, he, God was, was acting counter to he was turning the, the curse into a blessing, but this time it's the Spirit of God speaking. And he said this, beginning in 24.3, The oracle of Balaam, the son of Beor, the oracle of the man whose eyes have been opened, the oracle of the one who now hears the words of God, who sees the vision of the Almighty, falling down with his eyes uncovered. How lovely are your tents, O Jacob! Your encampments, O Israel, like palm groves that stretch afar, like gardens beside the river, like aloes that the Lord has planted, like cedar trees beside the waters. Water flows from his buckets. His seed shall be in many waters. His king shall be higher than Agag. His kingdom shall be exalted. God brought him out of Egypt and is for him like the horns of a wild ox. He will lick up all the nations, his adversaries. He will break all of their bones in pieces and pierce them through with his arrows. He crouches. He lays down like a lion, like a lioness who will rouse them up. Blessed are those who bless you and cursed are those who curse you. And that should make you think, by the way, of Genesis 12, 1 through 3. So here's this blessing again on the people of Israel that God originally gave to Abraham. And Balak is furious. Look what it says in verse 10. Balak's anger was kindled against Balaam. And he struck his hands together and Balak said to Balaam, I have called you to curse my enemies and behold, now you have blessed them these three times. Therefore, flee to your own place. I said I would honor you, but the Lord has kept you back from honor. The Lord has kept you back from riches. And Balaam said to Balak, did I not tell your messenger whom you sent to me? If Balak should give me his house full of silver and gold, I would not be able to go beyond the word of the Lord to do either good or bad of my own. Only what the Lord speaks, I will speak. And he goes, here's my fourth and final oracle. Balaam looks like he is a shining example of God's glory and grace. And here's the final oracle, which points to Jesus, by the way. He says, this is the oracle of Balaam, the son of Beor, the oracle of the man, I'm in uh, 2415, the oracle of the man whose eyes are open, the oracle of him who hears the words of God, who knows the knowledge of the Most High, who sees the vision of the Almighty, falling down with his eyes uncovered. I see him, but not now. This is a reference to Christ. I see him, but not now. I hold, behold him, but not near. A star will come out of Jacob, a scepter will arise out of Israel, and it will crush the forehead of Moab and break all the sons of Sheth. Uh, this crush this, the forehead of, of Moab. You might remember Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, the foreshadow of Christ crushing the head of the serpent. And that imagery is all throughout the Bible with God destroying his enemies. Edom shall be dispossessed. Seir, also his enemies, shall be disp dispossessed. Israel is doing valiantly. And as one and one from Jacob will exercise dominion and destroy the survivors of all the cities. Now, Balaam leaves, but Balaam does not leave before he does something. And it's subtle, so subtle that you will not catch it if you're just reading straight through the narrative. If you're reading 22 through 25, you're going to think Balaam is a shining example of God's a, a godly servant. But it says this in 25.1, while Israel lived in Shittim, the people began to whore with the daughters of Moab. So the people of God are now intermarrying with the daughters of the Moabites. These invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. And Israel joined himself to the Baal of Peor and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And so what happens is the people of God, my goodness, you need to keep reading this story. It's incredible. But 
24,000 people are going to die of the plague that day because they, because they turned away from the Lord, joined themselves to the gods of the Moabites by marrying their women and serving their idols. Where did that idea come from? The Bible tells us that Balaam, it was his idea. Balaam told Balak, look, I couldn't curse the people, but Balaam, the Bible tells us over in the New Testament in Peter and Jude that the deceitfulness of wealth Lord Balaam to say to Balak, like he still wanted the money. Balaam still wanted the money. So he says, look, you're worried that these people are going to destroy you. Have your daughters marry their sons and then they'll worship your gods and then they'll be your adversary. Sorry, they won't be your adversaries. They'll be your allies. This idea of the people intermarrying, this idea of the people intermarrying with the people of the Moabites, that was Balaam's idea. And we see that referenced for us in Deuteronomy 23, 4 and 5, Joshua 13, 22, Joshua 24, Revelation 2, Numbers 31, 16, 2 Peter 2, 15, Jude 1, 11. Balaam in the rest of the scripture is decried as an evil person. What did the angel of the Lord say to Balaam? He goes, I know that your way is perverse. He knew that. And Balaam draws the people into sin by advising King Balak to have the Israelite men marry the Moabite women and start serving their gods. And so Balaam looks good 22 through 24, but Balaam is, as we see in the book of Jude, another example of a false teacher. And so it is an interesting lesson, and there's a lot more that I want to say about that, but I think that that covers our time today. If you are going to join us tomorrow and you want to read ahead, Check out Deuteronomy 6 and 7. That's where we'll be tomorrow. Have a good day. Thank you so much for journeying with us today at Simpler Bible through another section of scripture where we come to know and understand God a little bit better. Look, if you're brand new to Simpler Bible, we have all sorts of resources available for you. Go to our website, simplerbible.com, and there you can find these videos. You can find our podcast. You can find links to our social media, and you can even find a blog post with additional scriptures if you want to go into a little bit more study than we had time to cover in this podcast and video today. We hope that this tool will be exactly that for you, a tool. Not something that replaces your daily walk with God, but something that enhances your daily walk with God and helps you to know and enjoy Him more. Thank you so much for being part of this, and we'll see you again tomorrow.